Praise the Lord. Can you open your Bibles to the book of First Peter this morning? First Peter chapter 2. Now, next week, we are going to have a special event that we normally do every uh, February. And this is our commissioning service. Say commissioning service. It is a moment that we ask all those who are involved in the ministry to be here. And then we commission them to the Lord. But it's also a moment that we renew our vows to be faithful in the call that God put us in or in the ministry that we are serving him. Now, a commissioning like this is very significant. Why? Because at the end, say at the end, at the end part after my message, everybody renews his covenant or covenant with God. And when you say renew the covenant, you are making a new pledge again. You are making a vow to God. Let me just say that what you're doing is holy. Say holy. Or what you will be doing next week is holy. Say holy. holy. It is sanctified because as a human being, you're making a covenant with God. And you know, whenever you make a covenant with God, you make a vow to God, you need to fulfill the vow. Is everybody here? It's not going to be done haphazardly or half-heartedly. If you are making a vow to God, God expects you not to break it. Because if you make a vow and you break it, you call it a sin. Right? That's why we are told in the scriptures that it is better for us not to make a vow at all if we will not be able to fulfill our vow. So the challenge will be given to all who are involved in the ministry and those who will still want to be involved to commit your life and your work dedicated to the ministry or the work of God here in the body and even outside the body or outside the church that you will be faithful to God for at least a year. Say, at least a year. When you're expected to be there, you have to be there. That's part of service to our God. However, this morning, I want to preach a precursor for next week. This is for all the workers, and I like to challenge you, as well as all the members of our church who are not yet involved in the ministry. My message this morning has to do with living as servants of God. Say, living as servants of God. And if you're ready for the Word of God, where is your Bible? I'd like you to lift up your Bibles. Lift up your Bibles way up high. Praise the Lord. And I want you to make a confession. Say, this is my Bible. This is the Word of God. This is the source of my strength. This is the source of my life. The Word of God will heal me. The Word of God will feed me. The Word of God will heal me. It will strengthen me, draw me closer to God, help me live a holy life before God. This will sustain me and bless me because the Word of God, it is life. And everybody said, First Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Here is what the Apostle Peter said, Live as free men. But do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as servants of God. Say, live as servants of God. Let's all pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for, we know that you are here with us. And I pray, Father, that everybody will hear your word. Use me as your mouthpiece to speak your word. As I lay this challenge before everybody, I'm asking you, Lord God, that you will uh, teach us this morning and use me to preach your word with cl clarity, Lord God, and under your anointing. We thank you. We bless you. In the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 
I got three things to speak to you this morning, and I like to start off with this one, that the lives that we have is a life meant to follow Jesus. The lives that we have is a life that we are to live uh, for God and not meant for us alone. Say, not meant for me alone. Living our lives for ourselves and for our pleasure is actually to live outside of the will of God. You have to remember what James said. I preached about this uh, several uh, months ago. James chapter 4, 13 to 16. And this is what the, uh, the apostle James said. Now listen, you say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry, out, or carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist or a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Meaning to say you are not to live your life outside of the will of God. You are not to do whatever you want to do without God being there in everything that you do. Verse 15 says, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live, do this or that. Now, as followers of Jesus Christ, our lives are meant for one thing. And that is to follow Jesus Christ all the days of our lives. Say, to follow Jesus all the days of my life. And you know, this is what Jesus requires to all who want to come to him. Like he said this to Peter, he said this to Matthew, he said this to Thomas, he said this to Philip, he said this to his 12 disciples and to those whom he called. Matthew 4, 19. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Say, follow me. Say that again. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, what I want you to, to note here is the phrase follow me appears, or appeared rather, 20 times in the Gospels. So this point that the life that we have, the life that, uh, in Christ that we have, uh, the one that we have surrendered to Jesus Christ is meant for that purpose, and that is to follow Jesus Christ, to be a true follower of the Lord. And now the question is, what does it mean to follow the Lord? Can you look at three people and say, what it is to follow the Lord? Three people. Okay. So that, that is the question, what it is to follow the Lord? Well, let me give you the Greek meaning of that word, follow. The Greek means to come and be behind. When Jesus said, follow me, he's telling everybody to come to him and be behind him. So let's, let's look at these two important things here. Number one, if you want to be a follower of Christ, first thing is to come. We come to Jesus Christ. We come to the person. You don't come to a church. You don't come to a person. You don't come to religion. You come to Jesus Christ. And that would indicate that you want to fully surrender everything to him. You come to the Lord repenting of your sins. Wanting him to be the Lord of your life. The savior of your, uh, of your life. So it means you are a follower of Christ. You are a student, you are a disciple, you are a servant of a master or a teacher or a rabbi. Now, how many of you have come to Jesus Christ? You came to the Lord way back, a point in your life. You came to him, acknowledged him, and you repented of your sins. Amen? You're born again. But that is just only half of following the Lord. The next thing that must happen is that you follow behind him. You come to him and you know where your place is. 
Your place is not in front of Jesus. Your place is not beside Jesus. Your place is behind Jesus. Say, behind Jesus. This means that you are following a master. You are a sheep. He is a shepherd. He is the leader of your life. You can never go ahead of Jesus. You follow him. You obey him. You go wherever he goes. And everybody said? So it's a manifestation of a person who has totally surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And if you have surrendered your life to the Lord, the next thing that must happen is that you follow him. Say, follow him. You follow or you dedicate yourself to be his sheep, to be behind him. He is the leader of your life. And everybody said, just like what we see in the pictures, the, the, the rabbi is always ahead of his disciples. And that's what was going on in the New Testament, the first century, um, Christian, uh, first century setting. Now, this is still true to our time. No Christian should ever go ahead of Jesus. And everybody said, or even do his thing. If you have decided to follow Jesus Christ, you obey him. You go where Jesus, uh, Jesus tells you to, do, uh, to go. You do whatever Jesus tells you to do. After all, he is our master, and simply we are his people who follow his command and his will. That is how you become a disciple of the Lord. Talking about discipleship, and next week we go back to our study on disciple, uh, discipleship. You come to Jesus and you follow him. You follow every word that he has spoken. And this following the Lord is for the rest of our lives. Not just a portion of our lives, but for the rest of our lives. There is no partial following. Or there is no partial serving the Lord. What I mean is this. That we only serve him whenever we are available or when we have the time. Or to simply to put it, when we have the convenience to serve the Lord. Now this is not what servitude is all about. Or what servitude is all about. There is no convenience in following Jesus Christ. If he expects us to do this, he expects us to be in the ministry to serve him, we don't serve according to our time. Are you here? There is no such thing as convenience Christianity. Luke chapter 9, we find the principle here, 57 to 58. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus' reply is kind of a little sarcastic. He replied, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man, he has no place to lay his head. Are you willing to be inconvenienced? I do not even know where I will rest. Are you willing to make such a sacrifice if you want to follow me? And still the principle is applicable today. When we follow him, we must be willing to be inconvenienced. Are you here? When you're expected to be there, when you're expected to sing, you must sing for God. When you're expected to play for the Lord, you are to be there. When you're expected to be uh, an usher, a sir lord, every weekend you are to be there. If you are a care group leader, you are to be in your group every week teaching people, are you here? Are you here? Not because I am tired, I cannot make it. As I've said, there is no inconvenience in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are times that we cannot even lay our heads to rest. How many of you have ever experienced that? Were you expected to be there? 
You cannot even lay your heads to rest. You got to work, work, work. And if, and if it is necessary for you not to sleep well or to sleep a little that night, you got to do it because you are expected to be in the service of the Lord. And everybody said, the work of Christ is our priority in this life as we follow him. That's why there, uh, I'm kind of amazed with people who are uh, working as a call center or they're working in the hospital. After their duty, they're still coming to church, even through a sleepless night. And they're not sleeping in church. They're listening. They're involved in the ministry. Is everybody here? Is everybody here? I know you go through tough times, work, work, study, studies from Monday to Saturday. But on Sunday, you ought to be in the house of God serving the Lord. Are you here? Only two people are saying amen. 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 The work of Christ is our priority as we follow the Lord. And it's not one of the things that we do. In fact, this is the main thing that we do. And what we are doing are simply connected to this work of Christ. Everything that we do revolves around the work of Christ. Are you here? Whether you be a student, whether you be a housewife, you be a doctor, you be a lawyer, an engineer, an architect, and so on. Those are not your top priorities, your work. I'm sorry to say that. Your top priority is Jesus Christ. And everything that you do revolves around the work. Say, around the work. And what is the work of Christ? What is the work of Christ? Well, already he had done the hardest part. Die on the cross. But what is the work of Christ right now? You don't know what is the work of Christ right now? Saving humanity. Are you here? Say, saving man. Look at five people around you and say, saving man. Saving man, saving man, saving man. That is the work of Christ right now. There was a movie that I watched many years ago, and I believe many of you have seen it too. And still it is on, uh, on Netflix. It's a movie called Saving Private Ryan. Have you seen that movie? Saving Private Ryan. Here is a company of soldiers whose order is to fight their way in order to save one insignificant private soldier. Hello? You are sending your man to rescue one insignificant, maybe nameless, when I'm saying nameless, not that important, you, he, 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 he doesn't even have a rank, one private soldier. And some members of the company would even lay their lives for the saving of this one private. Take a look at that. Some generals would not even think of sending his man just to rescue a private soldier. Let him die. I don't want my man to die saving this guy. And you know what? If we will relate this to our lives today, we are given a task by the commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ, to go and save the lost wherever they are in the world. We are not saving just one man. We're saving one man at a time. One soul at a time. Is everybody here? The order of Jesus Christ is for you to save any private Ryans around the world. You've got to look for these people. And there are people, missionaries, evangelists, pastors who are willing to give their lives 
in order to save one soul that you do not even know. Is everybody here? Look at three people and say, save your private Ryans. Look for them, rescue them, and save them. Is everybody here? Because we are here to save the world as ordered by the master whose name is Jesus, who is our God and our King. And everybody said, and everybody said, Amen. now with regard to this service, let me bring you to my second point, that serving the Lord is always something that our Father in heaven looks for among his people. Serving the Lord is always something that our Heavenly Father looks for among His people. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and let's read verses 12 and 13. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, Fear the Lord your God and what? Serve him how? Serve him only, and that word only means you are to serve him with a full, dedicated heart. Serve him alone. Take your oaths in his name. Now, this truth runs throughout the entire Bible from the Torah, or the first five books books of the uh, Old Testament that we call, to the book of Revelation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were people who served God all their days. Their devotion to God was unerring. It pleased God to make a covenant with these guys. Each one of them, God made a covenant. Not just to Abraham, but he made a covenant to Isaac. He made a covenant to Jacob. And likewise, he made a covenant with the entire people of Israel. And you got a nation with a call to serve God. Say, a call to serve God. One nation, Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. All of the whole earth is mine. You will be for me. Look at this. You, God is saying to the people of Israel, you will be for me. Okay? A kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. The key here is for all Israel to be for him a kingdom of priests. Not a kingdom of rebels, not a kingdom of soldiers, but a kingdom of priests. Say a kingdom of priests. And what do priests do? What do priests do? Exodus 28, verses 1 and 3, and Exodus 29, 44. 28, verse 1 says, Have Aaron, your brother, brought uh, to you among, from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab, Abihu, uh, Eleazar, Itamar, so that they may what? Serve me as priests. You will be for me a kingdom of priests. Verse 3, tell all the skilled men to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration. So what? So they may what? Serve me as priests. Exodus 29, 44. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons, what? To serve me as priests. So what do priests do? Serve God. God said to the people of Israel, you will be for me to serve me as a kingdom of priests. You will serve me. And this is to serve the Almighty God, to serve Elohim or the God of Israel as a whole nation. 
a kingdom of servants. Say a kingdom of servants. God's servants to be exact. The truth has, uh, has not been removed or taken out from the New Testament. In fact, it, it, this is strengthened more for the New Testament believers. This serving God runs through the entire four Gospels in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in all the writings, or the epistles of the great apostle Paul, and the other uh, New Testament writers like Jude, James, John. The truth is this, we are called to serve God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are called to serve God. And we are also called to be a kingdom of priests. This is clearly stated in uh, the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, the second half of verse 5 to 6. Are you with me this morning? To him who loves us. Thank God there's somebody who loves you in heaven. Look at somebody and say, Jesus loves you. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us what? To be a kingdom and priests for what reason? Just like the nation of Israel to serve his God and father to him be glory power and power forever and ever amen revelation 7:15 therefore they are before the throne of god the believers and serve him day and night where in his temple because we are priests we are to be in the temple of god and he who sits on the throne will spread his tent or his tabernacle or his glory over them. Revelation 22 verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. This is in reference to the new Jerusalem. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants, what? Will serve him. i like you to understand a great principle. Serving God is not just for this lifetime. What do you do in eternity? You will serve God forever and ever in his holy temple day and night. Are you here? And if you don't like serving God here, you will not want to serve God there. Service to God begins in this life. Are you here? Are you here? How many servants of God do we have in this place? And what do servants of God do? They serve. His servants will what? Serve him. How many servants of God do we have in this place? <clears throat> and how many servants are serving him? Nabawasana. If you're a servant of God, you serve him. Amen. All this clearly states what I've been sharing to you many times over, that we got saved not just to make it to heaven, but to serve God all the days of our lives. Because this is what we will be doing in eternity. No, you will not be in cloud nines strumming your heart for the rest of eternity. You will be in the very presence of God serving him. And I do not know what kind of a service we will do in the kingdom of God. In the new Jerusalem, which is the culmination of everything, of being a, a, a kingdom of priests, will all be an eternal reality. Say the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem will come down from heaven when God renews everything. When there is a new heaven and there's a new earth, God sends down the new Jerusalem. And the Bible says we will all live in the new Jerusalem. This is our eternal place. And we will serve God there forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we are not to forget or ignore or neglect this truth. 
by choice unto our God who actually, like Israel, brought us out of Egypt. He brought us from the land or the life of slavery so that we can become free. And everybody said, we have been brought from a life of sin in order to serve the Almighty God. However, there is still one thing I, wanna, I want us to learn about being servants of God. And this has to do really, uh, or very much connected to the title of my, mes my message, that we are to live as what? Servants of God. Let's go back to our text. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 16, are you receiving this? Peter said, live as free men. You're free. You've been freed from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. But do not let your freedom become a cover up for evil. Or do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as free, oh, I'm sorry, live as servants of God. Can you shout that? Live as servants of God. I said shout. One, two, three. Live as servants of God. Amen. I want you to notice firstly in this verse how Peter said, live as free men. We are to live as, uh, as free men because we have been freed from sin. Jesus redeemed us by his blood. How many free people do we have in the place? You've been delivered from sin. You've been delivered from the clutches of the devil. You've been delivered from eternal fire. Amen. And therefore, Peter said, live as free men. However, there is an irony here. Look at the first part and the last part. Live, live as free men and live as servants of God. You live your life as a free person, but you are to live as servants or slaves of God. Are you here? Are you here? So we have an irony. You live as a free man, but you're not totally free. Your servants are slaves of God. You got to live that way. Are you getting my point here? This is how I will explain it. Yes, for truth, we have been uh, delivered, set free from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are people who have been liberated by our master. We are free men. We are not in bondage anymore. This is our freedom in Jesus Christ. And everybody said... Look at three people around you and say, you're free, you're free, you're free. Amen. But I want you to listen. And yet there will be people among us who will abuse this freedom for a cover-up of something. This, the, the, there will be people whose hearts will be pulled back into the world. Why? It is because they will sell their freedom or they will use their seeming freedom as a cover up to doing evil again. Now the words cover up in the Greek means cloak. There's something that you put on, you put on a cloak, okay? You are wearing something. You're wearing sheep's clothing to cover up your evil intent. You know, it's so hard to hear this. After tasting the goodness of God, some people will wind up like wolves in sheep's clothing. They will abuse their being a Christian. They, were, uh, they will appear to you as a good servant of Christ, a good Christian, but they, uh, they have been deceived and they are trying to deceive other people too. And yet they are full of greed and adultery. Peter warns us, do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. I want you to listen carefully. There is a group of people who tell others that you are saved 
by the grace of Jesus Christ. This is not your work. This is the work of Christ. So even though you drink your way into hell, so to speak, you live as a drunkard, you live as an adult, uh, adul adulterous individual, you will still go to heaven. And you do all evil. And you are covering up by your freedom. Anyway, I'm free in Christ. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Let's drink more. And where is holiness here? Nothing. There is a cloak. And a cloak of hypocrisy. And that's not the way to live your freedom. If God calls you to live in freedom, you're free. Don't go back to a life that will bring you back to bondage and say, this is part of my freedom. Now, it's okay to drink one case of beer. Anyway, I'm saved by the grace of Christ. And if I die, I go to heaven. <laughs> Straight. You agree with me? Amen. And the rest of the guys are also saying, Amen, Rod. Let's drink more. Cheer up. There is a disguise. If you're free man, you ought to be a free man for Christ for the rest of your life. Are you here? So Peter is telling us, live as free men in Christ, but don't learn to get deceived by your own ways. We are to live our freedom as servants of Christ, servant of God Most High. I want you to listen carefully. One of the dangers of living a free man, and we don't serve God as his slaves, we don't have a church to attend to regularly. We are cruise-matics. We don't have any commitment at all, and we want to do whatever we want. You have no connection to the people of God. You know, that is very dangerous. The devil can easily pull you out or pull you down. Are you listening? There is no such thing as a freelancer in the kingdom of God. Say freelancer. There is no such thing. If you are a slave, a servant of God, you are a free man, you are to learn three things that you are still connected to God, or you are to be connected to God, you are to be connected to each other, the body, and you are, connect, you are to be connected to the work of God. Say God, God. Body, body, and work. Are you here? This is how you will be safe. If you're living out away from the body of Christ, you are not attending church, and you say, I'm a Christian still, and you don't pray to God, there's something wrong with your Christianity, your freedom. Your freedom is still what? Connected to God, connected to the body, to each one of us, and connected to the work. Can you say God, God. Body, body, and work? And if you are serving God, and you have this connection in this three, listen, you're safe. You're living as servants of Christ. Is everybody here? Because, you know, those people who are not busy in the body of Christ, you are an easy target of the enemy. You are not a swag in the kingdom of God, but you are a scalawag in the kingdom of God. 
This is how we can be selfish and how we can easily be deceived. Connection to what? God, body or each other, and the work. So we are free men who live to serve the Lord. Amen? Can you say that with me? One, two, three. We are free men who live to serve the Lord. One more time. We are servitude to God is what and why we are here. We are not here to be religious. We are simply attending Sunday services every weekend. But we live as God's servants in His holiness wherever we go, be it in church, be it at home, be it everywhere. Especially we take Christ and His gospel and spread His message around. This is our major, major work as servants of Christ. And in fact, this is how we are to be regarded by the people around us. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. So then, men ought to regard us. This is Paul speaking. Men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Here is Paul telling the Corinthian uh, believers, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. You know, Paul is talking about him and his ministry and those who are involved in the work of God. But this is inclusive also of those people who are really serving the Lord. People should regard us as servants of God and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Can you say, regard us? Now, what do you mean by this? This is how people should look at us. The Greek word for regard us, or the Greek meaning, means to account us, to take inventory of us, or to estimate us. To take account of us, like an accountant, they look at your life, Tignan kung may, may, meron kong balance sheet or whatever. You put everything into record to take inventory of us or to estimate us. Another way uh, to say that is to make a full investigation of our lives. You know, when people make a full investigation of our lives, I hope they, uh, they will not be able to say anything then these people are really servants of God. If people will account your life, or if God will account your life, if God will take inventory of your life, how are you living for Christ? Is there any skeleton in the closet? Hello? Are you hiding something? Or you are really serving Christ publicly and privately? We ought to be like Peter and John. Like when they were brought to the Sanhedrin court in the book of Acts. Acts 4.13. This is my last verse, but I will still expound this a little. When they saw the Sanhedrin court, so the carriage of Peter and John, and realize, say realize, that means they have taken inventory of them. They have taken an account of these people and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note. This is their conclusion. Take note that these men had been with Jesus. These guys made an inventory of Peter and John's life. Realize that they are unschooled individual, individuals or ordinary men. But they got the shock of their, shock of their lives. Because these men were intelligent. They flow with the power of God, the anointing of God. They know the scriptures more than them. And they operate by the power of God. So they were astonished and they took note or they concluded that this man had been with Jesus. Is everybody here? This simply means that they are disciples of Christ or followers of Christ or in short, these are servants of Christ. 
When people look at our lives and they take inventory of our lives, I pray that they will not be able to say anything than these people are really born again Christians who follow Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. Amen? Amen? You know what? We are not to evade our lives from the world. We should be open for the world to look into our lives. We don't cover up ourselves. But what we are in church is what we are publicly. And what is the most important thing is outside, not inside. Hello. How do sinners look at your life? How do people regard you? Would they say, oh, I know, born again, Kunu. Uh, they say that they are born again, but, you know, they are the most, uh, what they call this, the most annoying people in town. I hope that people will not be able to say anything negative of us. And this is reflected in the lives that we live, the words that we speak, and the work that we do. Serving Christ is everything. Can you say that again? Serving Christ is what? Everything. One more time. It is a whole round service and how we live and the message we bring to everyone should always lead them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We got to look for the private Ryans of the world and save them. Are you here? Now, last week we have listened, last weekend we have listened to Brother Amir and Pastor Barry and they're talking about Jesus is coming soon. How many of you believe that Jesus is coming very soon? And what are we to do in the light of their returning? Pastor Barry challenged everybody at SMX, and he said, like how I've been preaching to you, that we cannot bring things to heaven, and the only thing that we can bring to heaven are people. You cannot bring your wealth to heaven. The very clothes that you die in, you cannot bring them to heaven. You can only bring people or souls. So therefore, let us occupy ourselves. Let us work. <clears throat> let us be in our Father's business as we await the returning of the Lord. Let us <clears throat> live as servants of God. Is everybody here? Is everybody here? And I hope that you have received the message of God this morning. And those of you who are involved in the ministry, and those of you who are not yet involved in the ministry, I will challenge you to be involved. We're not here just to sit down and do our own thing, <clears throat> but we need to be subservient to Jesus Christ, serving him for the rest of our lives. And everybody said, those of you who need to open your homes for the gospel, for Bible studies, please open your homes. And those of you who uh, can speak the message to everyone, please speak the message. But this task is given to everybody. Now, next week, as I've shared to uh, the 7.30 congregation, that I'm working on this theme for my message next week during commissioning service. And this has to do with how God demands commitment from his people. Are you here? If we are servants of God, he demands commitment. Look at your neighbor and say, he demands commitment. I haven't uh, really worked on that sermon, but I'm contemplating, I'm thinking of the thought that God has dropped in my heart. He demands commitment. <clears throat>